Tatiana, or Tanya as her friends called her, was born in Tomsk, Siberia in 1909. Her mother, the daughter of a prominent general, was a physician, her father a chemist. World War I shattered their peaceful existence. In 1915, Tanya's father was sent to the United States to supervise arms manufacturing for the Tsar. With the coming of the Russian Revolution, the family was trapped and began a new life in suburban Philadelphia. At work on the first biography of Praskuryakov, Shar Solomon has been uncovering these early details of her life. Tanya's story is compelling to me because she was born in Russia at such a tumultuous time. She came to the United States. She, she acquired English as a second language and, and mastered it in such a way that it became the equivalent of her first language. She chose a profession that was dominated by men at a time when many women did not choose to go that route. Tanya majored in architecture at Pennsylvania State University, one of the only women to do so in her graduating class. It was 1930, the height of the Great Depression. Tanya spent several dispiriting years looking for work, then settled for a job making drawings for a needlepoint shop. The search for good subjects led her to the Archaeological Museum at the University of Pennsylvania. Tanya's skillful drawings attracted the attention of Linton Satterthwaite, an archaeologist looking for an artist to work at his dig deep in the jungles of Guatemala. The ruined city of Piedras Negras was a big jump from her close-knit Russian family. But Tanya was ready for an adventure. The small party set off for Guatemala in the winter of 1936. On their way, they stopped at Palenque, the graceful, ruined city that had captivated the explorers Stevens and Catherwood almost a hundred years before. Tanya was equally entranced. She, in older years, said that when she first saw the elegant little Temple of the Sun, she knew she had found her vocation, that there would never be anything else that would get her as much as that. Tanya's pencil responded easily to the intricacies of Maya art. The young Russian-American had felt the pulse of an ancient mystery. But settling into Piedras Negras wasn't easy. Tanya had to learn how to survey and draw the dilapidated ruins. As an outsider, as a woman who had learned a profession and trying to find a way into it, I'm sure she was clearly, uh, you know, little Tanya, allowed to sit there with her, her drafting pen and make observations about Piedras Negras. I think she had to pay for every step she took, but she really, I think, was someone who was able to compete effectively with the boys. In Maya archaeology in the 1930s, the boys were a pretty formidable bunch. This was a group of people that came together, people from mostly Ivy League and, and uh, Harvard and, and uh, Penn and, and other places that were all close friends. They were all, as most archaeologists were at the time, people of independent means. They could do what they darn well pleased. 
these silver spoon archaeologists managed to live well. At Piedras Negras, dinner was a formal occasion, beginning with cocktails. Somewhere around five o'clock, they would dress, and they would dress elegantly. Tanya had a white dress, full-length dress, that she packed along with her, and she would slough through the mud to get to the dining hut, and then sort of tuck the muddy bottom of her dress down behind her feet so that no one would notice. There was a little bit of challenging banter also between Tanya and Linton. Uh, he had, had suggested that one of the structures did not have a staircase going up one side. And she felt strongly that there would have been and challenged him on that point. And so he said, well, if you really believe that there was a staircase there, then you'll have to dig and find me the proof, which she did. And to her delight, she found the staircase. Tanya began to sketch reconstructions of the ruins based on the archaeological data. Her drawings were so impressive, they earned her a sketching tour of other Maya cities. Her first stop was Copan. Noted Mayanist Ian Graham shared an office with Tanya in her later years at Harvard's Peabody Museum. He remembers her tales of Copan in the 30s. Anyway, she landed uh, so female in, in this um, isolated camp. There were some fairly spirited characters there. One was an amazing man called Gus Stromsvik. Gustav Stromsvik, uh, the Norwegian archaeologist who worked for the Carnegie Institution, fell deeply in love with her. And Tanya had a period in which she tried to decide what this relationship was going to mean in her life. Stromsvik was uh, a very dynamic personality. He was very outgoing. He was a raconteur, and she loved people who could tell good stories. She loved to laugh. So she was drawn to him, but on the other hand, Stromsvik had a very serious drinking problem. On, particularly on Saturday nights, the, the life there was pretty wild. Tanya seemed to handle it perfectly well. It's amazing. She led such a protected life in her Russian family and in her suburban life in Philadelphia, but she had, uh, she had grit. Tanya's next stop was Chichen Itza, center of the Maya world in this golden age of archaeology. The ancient city was undergoing a renaissance, as archaeologists from the Carnegie Institution pieced it back together. building has gone hand in hand with the work of repair. Welcoming the throngs of visitors was the man who would serve as the spokesman for the Maya for more than 20 years, Carnegie's Sylvanus Morley, known for his oversized straw hats and ebullient personality. At Chichen Itza, he lived in grand style in a Spanish colonial manor house. Every evening, a Chinese cook would prepare dinner for Morley and his band of archaeologists. Envious colleagues referred to them as the club. On special evenings, Morley would lead his guests to the ruins of the Maya ball court for a concert, amplified by the court's amazing acoustics. Tanya would join the others in the moonlight, in this fitting place to conjure the spirits of the departed Maya. For to the Carnegie Club, 
the Maya were a band of priestly stargazers, unlike any other people who had ever lived. These ancient wise men had never fought wars. Instead, they had spent their time inventing an elaborate calendar and a system of writing used for nothing but recording time. The author of this view of the Maya was Sir Eric Thompson, an acerbic Englishman whose intellect dominated Maya studies for nearly 50 years. No one, not even Morley, questioned his authority. As Thompson began to formulate his ideas, no one had the strength of character to resist. Morley was the one who tried. In Morley's early works, he offers a rather different picture. He is overwhelmed by Thompson's point of view and adopts it. This makes it very difficult for a new voice to find a path, and particularly when one can imagine that the name of Tanya is probably generally preceded by Little. Thompson may have been able to cow the other members of the Carnegie Club, but he hadn't bargained on Tanya Praskuryakov.